Shiny Pokemon are perhaps the most treasured thing in the Pokemon games. They first appeared in the Space World 97 demo of Gold and Silver, where they were very simplified and had some unique quirks. There was no animation that played when you encountered a Shiny, and due to technical limitations, Pokemon that shared a palette when they weren't Shiny would also share a palette when they were Shiny, leading to less variety with Shiny colors. They were also much more common in the demo than the full game. You had about a 1.977% chance to find one. When the full game was released, the above oddities were no longer present, but there were still a number of weird and noteworthy things about Shiny Pokémon. But what makes them so odd? Let's find out. Now, if I want to be as comprehensive as I can, I gotta go over a couple of basic things that I think most people know, but these might also be things that younger, newer, or less knowledgeable fans of the series know about, so bear with me for a moment here. First, let's go over how the game determines if a Pokémon is shiny, because it's actually different compared to Gen 3 on. In every other mainline Pokémon game, whether a Pokémon is shiny or not is determined by the Pokémon's personality value, in conjunction with your Trainer ID and Secret ID. In Generation 2, a Pokémon's IVs are used to determine whether it's shiny or not. Specifically, the Defense, Special, and Speed IVs all need to be 10, and the Attack IV needs to be 2, 3, 6, 7, 10, 11, 14, or 15. Since IVs go from 0 to 15 in Gen 2, this means that the odds of finding a shiny Pokémon are 1 in 8,192, which is what the odds stayed at until X and Y, when they became 1 in 4,096, or double what it was prior. Now, of course, shiny Pokémon were a brand new thing in Gen 2, and so Game Freak wanted to make sure you knew about them. Or so I assume, anyway, because of the forced encounter with the shiny Gyarados partway through the main game. The only other mainline game with a forced shiny Pokémon is Black and White 2, which actually had multiple forced shiny Pokémon. And then, in Crystal specifically, the player can get an egg that's referred to as the Odd Egg. Much like its name implies, the Odd Egg is... quite odd. See, the Odd Egg has, at random, one of the seven baby Pokémon introduced in Gen 2, and there's no way to know which baby Pokémon you've got until the egg hatches. Furthermore, the Odd Egg has a 50% chance to contain a shiny Pokémon, making it the highest chance to get a shiny Pokémon in any game but only in Japan. Maybe. See, if you look into the Odd Egg on Bulbapedia, there's a citation needed next to the claim that the Odd Egg has a 50% chance of being shiny in the Japanese version, so we don't know for sure that that's the case. And to complicate matters more, getting the Odd Egg in the Japanese version of Crystal is completely different than how you get it in the international version. So to get the Odd Egg in the Japanese version, first you need the Mobile Game Boy Adapter, which... there's a lot to take in here. You would use the Mobile Game Boy Adapter to hook up your Game Boy Color to a mobile phone in order to access Mobile System GB, which was basically the most primitive version of online connectivity there was in the Pokémon series. One of the things you could access with the Mobile System GB is what may have been the first online event, which would allow players to receive the egg ticket from the daycare man. A player with the egg ticket could then give said ticket to the Pokémon Center nurse in the Pokémon Communication Center in Goldenrod City, who would then give the player the odd egg in return. Now, since no country other than Japan got the mobile Game Boy adapter, that meant there was no mobile system GB to access, which would have made the odd egg inaccessible to everyone outside of Japan. If it weren't for the international versions of Pokémon Crystal changing things around so that the daycare man just gives you the odd egg, no egg ticket required. This might be the only instance of something in a Pokémon game being event-only in Japan, but then available in the game without an event in the international versions of the game. Also in the international versions, the Odd Egg has a 14% chance to house a shiny Pokémon, as opposed to the alleged 50% chance the Japanese version has. But some Pokémon are more common than others. It's not an even chance to get any of the seven Pokémon that can be in there. The easiest shiny Pokémon to get are Cleffa and Igglybuff, while the rarest are Pichu and Tyrogue. 
Speaking of eggs being odd and shiny Pokémon coming from them, I'd like to turn things over to a special guest to help explain some of the more fascinating aspects of Pokémon eggs and shininess in Gen 2. Breeding for shiny Pokémon is never a straightforward process, but in every generation except for Gen 2, it's at least possible with enough time and a little bit of luck, no matter the stats of the parents. So long as you're getting eggs, there's a chance to hatch the shiny variant. You see, in every main series game where breeding is possible, the IVs of the parent Pokémon are passed down in one way or another. The problem is that in Generation 2, the IVs of a Pokémon are literally what determine if a Pokémon will be shiny. So the stats of the parent Pokémon are so important that no matter how many eggs you hatch, most pairings of Pokémon will never be able to pop out a shiny baby. But that's not to say it's completely impossible to hatch shiny Pokémon. We just need to be smart about it. When two Pokémon are in the daycare together and create an egg, a series of steps are taken to pass their genetics down to their offspring. First, they pass nothing down, and a completely random attack IV is generated. It's important to do this first because the attack IV determines the gender of the Pokémon. Depending on what the resulting gender is, the defense and special IVs will be inherited from the opposite gender parent. The special stat has a 50% chance to inherit the exact stat of its parent, or a stat that has been increased or decreased by 8. The special stat will be increased if it's 7 or below, or decreased if the special stat is 8 or above. So if we breed the Lake of Rage Gyarados with a female Dragonite, the Dratini that hatches from the resulting egg would inherit Gyarados's IVs if it were a female, or Dragonite's IVs if it were a male. If the baby Dratini was female, it would inherit a defense stat of 10 from its father and either a special stat of 10, or 50% of the time, the modified special stat of 2. Finally, a fully random speed stat is rolled. If we take a look at the overall odds of getting a shiny egg here, what are they? First, we can see that any male Dratini would never be shiny, because if the Dragonite's IVs are passed down, the stats are all wrong. So we have to pass the 50% gender roll. Then, there's a 50-50 chance to roll one of the 8 attack stats that can create a shiny, a 50-50 chance to pass down our special stat properly, and a full 1 in 16 chance to roll exactly 10 on the random speed stat. That gives us odds of 1 in 128 to hatch a shiny. Honestly, pretty good odds, especially compared to the fact that the Generation 3 games that came afterwards were almost always the full 1 in 8,192 odds to hatch shinies. I know that was a lot to consume all at once, especially if you're new to Generation 2 shiny stuff. But for you newcomers, I want to ask you a question, and be honest down in the comments section about this. How many of you are now asking yourself, why don't we just breed two shiny Pokémon together to have 1 in 64 shiny odds? This one is weird. You can try it for yourself, but the Pokémon will look you dead in the eyes, apparently brimming with energy, and then proceed to never produce an egg. The reasoning is that Generation 2 is the only game that doesn't seem interested in promoting incest. Since the defense and special stats of shiny Pokémon will always be the same, the game will assume they are related. This goes for any two Pokémon that would pass down both the same defense and special stat, even if the special stat is 8 apart. There are still two ways to reduce the shiny odds right down to 1 in 64 though. If you breed a female Pokémon with a 100% female gender ratio with a male shiny Pokémon, you never need to worry about the gender roll. The same goes if you breed a 100% male Pokémon with a female shiny Pokémon. But luckily, it's also possible to do this with Ditto, and the baby will always inherit Ditto's stats, regardless of its gender. Shiny hunters call the Ditto's they use for this trick, Shiny IV Ditto's. Since attack and speed are never passed down, any Ditto with a 10 defense stat, neither a 2 or a 10 special stat, will breed with a 1 in 64 chance for each egg. Even within their first game, shiny Pokémon had some amazing ways to produce whole armies of differently colored pixels. A big thank you to Professor Rex for that explanation, and if any of you out there are craving some more videos about shiny Pokémon throughout the series, be sure to go check out Professor Rex's channel, link in the description below, and also check out Arbor Week 2023, a charity event featuring streamers shiny hunting for tree-related Pokémon while raising money for the Rainforest Trust an organization dedicated to protecting rainforests and the species of animals that call them home. You can find out more info about this event in the description.
But hey, we're not done talking about the various ways shiny Pokémon are different in Gen 2. We've gone into plenty of detail about how to get shiny Pokémon, but what about the shiny Pokémon themselves? When you think of a shiny Charizard, you most likely imagine this guy. After all, that's shiny Charizard. Here's shiny Gligar, shiny Ponyta, and shiny Suicune. But these shiny Pokémon all have something in common. They weren't always like this. There are a number of Pokémon that underwent drastic alterations to their shiny colors between Gens 2 and 3. One example that sticks out in my mind is how Elekid's shiny in Gen 2 becomes its non-shiny version in Gen 3. Electabuzz does not get the same treatment, although it's another example of a shiny that gets a drastically different color scheme. Machop is another noteworthy one, because non-shiny Machop also gets a completely different color. Really, Gen 3 shiny Machop looks pretty similar to its Gen 2 non-shiny version, but then Gen 2 shiny Machop is just... never to be seen again. Machoke and Machamp also received different non-shiny forms in Gen 3, and while the shiny forms received a little change in Gen 3, it wasn't until Gen 4 that the color differences became more noticeable. So while this means that Gen 2 isn't the only generation to have different colors for their shiny forms, it's definitely the generation with the most changes. This isn't a comprehensive list of all the Pokémon with changes, by the way. There are others, like Pidgeot, that have pretty noticeable changes, but there are also some Pokémon with changes that can probably be attributed to limitations with palettes. In Gen 2, Blastoise's shell and body are the same colors, but then in Gen 3, the shell and the body have different colors, and these apply to both the shiny and non-shiny versions of Blastoise. And if you want to see a perfect example of palette limitations in Gen 2, look no further than the Cyndaquil line. Where's the blue back? See, in Gen 2, each Pokémon is comprised of four colors, white, black, and then two other colors that can be whatever. So for the Cyndaquil line, these two colors are needed for the flames coming out of it, so the back has to be colored black with hints of orange. This is why the shiny for this line changes the colors of the flames, and consequently part of the back. That's all they could do. But then in Gen 3, Cyndaquil and company get a fancy new blue color for their back, and a shiny that changes the color of the back and the body, but keeps the flames completely the same. Something that wouldn't have been possible in Gen 2. One more funny thing with shiny Pokémon in Gen 2 has to do with perhaps one of the most unique Pokémon in the series, Unknown. In Gen 2, Unknown has 26 different forms, one for each letter of the Latin alphabet. But how does the game determine which form an Unknown will be? Well, in Gen 2, and Gen 2 only, Unknown's form is determined by its IVs. Do you see where this is going? Because of Unknown's form being determined by IVs, and shininess also being determined by IVs, only certain forms of unknown can be shiny. Those forms? They're unknown I and unknown V. Yes, only I and V have the right IVs to be shiny. This is purely coincidental, as IV is a fan-made term, but it's still a hell of a coincidence that that's how it works. IVs actually determine a number of things in Gen 2, like the Pokémon's gender, for example, the starter Pokémon have a 7 male to 1 female gender ratio, meaning you're 7 times more likely to get a male starter than a female one. If you do get lucky and get a female starter in Gen 2, though, it can only have an attack IV of 0 or 1, meaning the attack stat will either be the lowest it can be, or the second lowest it can be. One interesting side effect of this is that Pokémon with the 7 male to 1 female gender ratio can only be shiny if they're male. Because the lowest the attack IV can be for a shiny Pokémon is 2, and female Pokémon in the 7 male to 1 female gender ratio can't have an attack IV higher than 1, you can't have these Pokémon be both female and shiny. Now, the list of Pokémon with this gender ratio is fairly small, and is mostly comprised of starter Pokémon, as previously mentioned, alongside the Pokémon that are revived from fossils. The only exceptions that are in Gen 2 are Togepi and Snorlax. Of course, in later generations, this is no longer the case, as IVs no longer determine whether a Pokémon is shiny or what gender it is. And that's about everything I wanted to cover! 
There are some glitches related to shiny Pokemon, like one that lets you turn any wild ditto into a shiny ditto, but I want to focus on intended mechanics more than unintentional things like glitches. There's really a lot of interesting things about the older Pokemon games, especially with the kinds of technical limitations these games have, and I think it's really neat how even something like shiny Pokemon had so many aspects that were very quickly changed. I honestly find it pretty fascinating going down rabbit holes like this. A big thank you once again to Professor Rex for joining me in today's video. Be sure to check him out for more cool videos on shiny Pokemon. But first, be sure to leave a comment and let me know what your favorite fact in the video was. And with that, thank you so much for watching everyone. If you want to help the channel, leave a like, leave a comment, and make sure you're subscribed. Check out what's on the screen for some more Pokemon content too. A big thanks to Lord McAfee, Mithril Monarch, and the rest of my patrons for going the extra mile and financially supporting the channel. See you next time, everyone.